Thank you, Tira, for the history and the introduction to OMR. So now let's dive directly into OMR. <coughs> and one of the things with OMR is that it has been notoriously underestimated. So whenever you see someone talking about OMR or thinking about it that has not actually been involved in this field, they think like, oh, how many, and how hard can it be? And at my university, there is still a class where the uh, professor gives the student the task of solving OMR sort of in one semester. And this is not no joke, this is really still being done. So they try to, you know, detect some nodes on one image and then they're already happy if they can achieve this. So the question is, what actually makes this thing so complicated that we've been working on it for 60 years and we still haven't solved it? I mean, we're still here, this is still something we're struggling with. And to understand why this is so complicated, let's start with the representation of music. So whatever you have some sort of music, you have to represent it in a way that is implicitly, that, that, is, that must be lossy. It's really hard to get everything in there directly. So whatever representation we choose to abstract the reality, it will be lossy. And for music, we can have several representations. For example, we can record the audio, would be one possibility. We can write it down in scores. We can um, represent it in, in simple formats like MIDI, which just presents the notes, the onsets, and the durations. Um, or we can have something like what we have here in, in modern notation. And the thing with common Western music notation, it's the term is not always exactly, but it's like referred to as modern notation. Um, it is extremely complex. So if you're talking to musicians, they will agree that what you can represent in modern notation can be really, really complex. There are a lot of subtleties that you have to deal with. And one of the problems with modern notation is that there are rules, of course, how to read them, what's in there, but they're often violated. And you can have like minor violations, but there are also like major violations that musicians actually would say this is not valid syntactically, but still it's in there. So we have to deal with this somehow. And if you want to know more about this, I would definitely recommend Donald Byrd's gallery of interesting music notation. He has collected hundreds of samples of like famous comp uh, composers, pieces that actually violate music notation or have some extremes where, that you wouldn't expect of music, like 12 ledger lines or something, which is kind of weird to read anyway. To understand the complexity a little bit better, um, let's come back to um, the representation of music. We have like audio, MIDI, and common Western music notation. Let's stick with these three and compare it to text, to spoken language. We can have a similar comparison here. We can have the spoken text, if you record it, that's the recording. You can have a plain text file, or you can have a complex encoding of the things like an HTML web page. And in music here, there, is, there are some things that are specifically to modern notation. So, of course, there is all of the graphical complexity that we have. For example, here, um, there is a lot going on in this simple snippet of Valérie Chopin's um, Nocturne. Um, but there is one thing which I'd like to point out for the musicians of you who might want to count the 16th in this bar. Do you notice something? Yeah, there's like one sixteenth too much in this bar. So <laughs> this is one of those violations in modern music notation that you actually have to deal with when you want to do OMR. And there are the graphical aspects here, like a lot of scores, a lot of notes, very densely packed. Uh, and of course you can have all of those other things, like the, the image might be deteriorated and so on and so forth. But the problem is the structural complexity that you can't get rid of. 
So music notation is complex because it is powerful and can represent many things. And as I said before, these rules are sometimes violated on purpose to simplify scores, for example. You omit the thirds for repeating tuplets to make it visually um, simpler. And the way how musicians deal with this is that there are like two hypotheses how to interpret these scores. One does not make any sense, the other one does make sense, so you go for the one which makes sense. And this is something you actually have to build into your system to make it work on a general way. So, when we talk about the complexity of music, there is kind of a natural limit where we would say that OMR is kind of forced to stop. And that's at the point where musicians do not agree on what this means. So if even humans can't agree on what this is supposed to mean, how can a machine do it? So that's kind of one thing. And when you think about these rules that you have to build in order for an OMR system to represent that complexity, it's nearly impossible to list all those rules. I mean, you can start with some, and that's a common pitfall that many researchers have fallen into. They started with the simple rules, and you, you know, start to detect simple scores, and you add more and more and more rules, until eventually you hit this point where this thing becomes so complex that you can't handle it anymore, or can't handle it properly. And of course, I've been talking a lot about modern mu music notation, but this is not um, restricted to modern music notation. There are a lot of other notations as well um, that also have a lot of complexity built into themselves. For example, if you have um, manual notation or any of the preceding notations before the modern notation, um, the things we see, the symbols, the glyphs, are actually dependent on the area and the time when they were written. So you can't build a general system for all of these things, you have to have some additional knowledge. And of course there are some other beautiful things that I can't even read. <laughs> so I don't know how to, how to read these things. But there are like a lot of other uh, notation systems that you also, if you think about OMR on a wider scale, has, have a lot of challenges to offer. Coming back to optical music recognition versus OCR, this is something which we frequently encounter with people saying like, oh, OMR is like OCR for music. Uh, this is actually really nice comparison if you think about, okay, you have an image of text, OCR text. Um, and when you put it on a slide like this, okay, we've got image of music scores, OMR encoded music. But think about the representation again. So, we had, say, this is an Im input, so it's an image of the website of Wikipedia, and we put it into our OCR component, we get something like the headline, Wikipedia, die Freie Enzyklopädie, like the title of the website. That's what OCR is doing. But, OMR is actually doing more. We're not only recovering the music, we're also recovering the way it was represented. Like if we were recovering the HTML from the image. That's kind of the thing you have to understand if you get encountered with someone saying, oh, it's just OCR for music. No, it's not. It's as if you were recovering the HTML source code of the image of a website. That's about the same complexity level if you compare OMR to OCR. And these are not the same. Okay, to um, briefly um, get through the challenges now, um, when we think about OMR, what is the thing we're actually putting OMR? I would like to briefly skim over the things for you to get an impression on all the things you could potentially do with OMR as input. So, of course there are a lot of things, like there's quite a heterogeneity given the different inputs, um, and an even bigger challenge sometimes is how to properly output the things as well. But for the first part I just want to talk about the inputs here. 
So the thing you immediately think about OMR is, okay, we put in an image of music scores, but there are also like a whole new avenue of putting it way in an online fashion. So we capture the strokes of the user as he's writing the scores. And there are some applications that are trying this. So that is like online OMR, as we would call it. The way how it's engraved can have various shapes. So the thing which seemingly is easier, of course, is if it was typeset properly, so all symbols have the same, exactly the same shape. But more often, especially if you look at historical manuscripts, they were handwritten. Typically overprinted stuff lines. In some cases, as we've seen before, they were like also hand drawn. Then it becomes even harder. We have a whole bunch of notational types, as I've said before, common Western music notation, a whole bunch of historical preceding notations, like mensural. Um, then we have a wide range of instrument-specific notations, and even some modern notations of people that try to come up with a successor of the modern notation, uh, but so far none of them has actually you know, substituted modern notation on a large scale, at least. When you've got images, you've got all of the problems with images, so you scan them, you take pictures of them with the camera, then you would like to have something like an ideal condition scan or something, but the reality is often that you don't have this. You've got an image that was deteriorated, that was scanned, skewed, whatever. So if you have a camera-based scenario, then you've got all of the things you also have in other um, document analysis projects or, or settings, like blurring, skewing, and of course if you have manuscripts, then they are sometimes degraded quite heavily with bleed-through and, and other issues. One of the things we actually cannot eliminate, and this comes back to the complexity I've been talking before, is the, the structural complexity, and to make it a little bit more understandable, or like you can see it here. On the one end of the spectrum we have single stuff, single voice, linearly readable. On the other side we have something like piano form, where you've got multiple stuffs, each of the stuff can have multiple voices, and they interact with each other. So all of this has to be understood, and then we've got some overlapping symbols here, which doesn't make it any easier either. Um, so that's kind of the, the other spectrum of music notation. So if someone says, well, OMR is solved, just give him this. <laughs> and ask him to scan that, please. So the big question I'd like to try to make you aware of is how to handle this complexity. Because I've just shown you a lot of things, how you can quite, quite quickly make the challenge extremely hard. So how is this kind of possible for us to actually do something useful? So one thing you, you have to acknowledge probably is that a universal OMR solution is probably out of reach. At least for now, we're trying hard to push this field but it's really hard. Um, what we can do is develop a general workflow and um, by enforcing interoperability and common standards exchange individual parts of that workflow to make them work on certain data sets with machine learning. So that's right now one of the most promising avenues uh, which many of us are following right now and with this data-driven machine learning approaches, they're very generic, and you can apply them on your data set. And this is something we actually want to show you today, how you can actually make use of OMR. With that said, I give the microphone to Jan. So thanks, Alex. Now you are all probably very scared of this thing, as you should be. <laughs> And we have seen the difficulties of the input end and how we can get a taxonomy of what OMR is eating. You know, this camera thing, for instance. And we still need uh, to clarify what's going on on the other end. 
So how does a document that contains music notation come into existence? Well, there's a composer, and he wants to convey some music, right? What you would usually do if you haven't been living in Europe for the last couple of hundred or a thousand years, you would think of this music in terms of notes, and a note is this abstract object that we usually parameterize with pitch, which means which key you are, would be pressing on a piano or an organ, its duration, so how long you're pressing it for, its loudness, on a piano this means how strong you press it, when you're singing it means how close the mic is to your mouth. Uh, you get different time timbers, which has to do with instrumentation and the spectral properties that you want to get, and you have to place this note into uh, onto a timeline. We call this the onset. I mean, if you've been working in a Maillard, you know these terms. Then, uh, within a composition, you further group these, let's say, atomic objects, or mostly atomic objects, into some other logical units, so you assign them to voices, especially if you're a Hans Sebastian Bach, you do a lot of this. Uh, you put them into measures, if you're writing dance music, for instance, this is a critical thing, etc., etc. So you conceptualize your idea with notes. And then you have to make some decisions about how to convey this visually. You have the music notation system for writing, but as we've seen, there are many ways to use or misuse this system. And if you want a musician to actually read what you have written, you have to write this in a clear and legible way. You have to convey this information that we've seen before. So not just the notes, but also some of their logical groupings uh, so that people can actually read it. If you are writing a four-part chorale, like Bach was mostly doing, uh, you probably want to write it in four parts, especially if you want actually four people or four groups of people to sing it. It's a bad idea to do this thing on top, which is just put everything on one stuff, use chords, and, and stop caring. So once you make these decisions, how to best express this configuration of notes within the constraints, or mostly within the constraints of common Western music notation, you then sit down and actually embody this into a document. For most of history, this would have been a physical document. Today, we also have born digital music notation if you just typeset it in onto a computer. But you still have to make these decisions about how many staffs you are going to use, etc. Et so this is how we get food for OMR systems. How do OMR systems digest this? Well, one way of doing this is recovering the music notation itself. So going back one step and looking at the decisions that the composer made, and this is especially useful if you're trying to give the score to another musician, but maybe much nicer, because the manuscripts are really hard to read sometimes. So for all these retypesetting applications, this is the step that you are making. On the other hand, you can also try to recover this, these notes, and this is especially useful if you want, for instance, to index the Liberius Alis, as we have seen before. You want to recover these semantics. And what you want to do really affects some design decisions. For instance, if you are recovering notes for this replay thing, you can usually use MIDI as a format. Uh, if you are trying to reprint music notation and give it to musicians, MIDI is not enough. And suddenly you will have a hard time designing, uh, for I don't know, end-to-end -end recognition systems to output a tree structure. So this was kind of the abstract structure of OMR tasks. What can we ask these systems to do? And we can group the specific applications, like you know, listening to songs you cannot really play for yourself, or uh, retrieve things in a huge archive. For instance, uh, people are looking for copies of pieces to trace how music spread throughout mostly this for Europe. Uh, so you would want to be able to search the scans from different countries. Uh, these applications generally fall 
into a bunch of those who require OMR for replayability and those that actually require you to recover not just what the music notation means, but also the music notation itself. So the, the blue ones are where you really cannot discard the picture. And with that in mind, we can have some fun. Okay, it's time to try some of these applications to actually see how OMR fares nowadays. And we're going to start with commercial applications because there are commercial applications claiming to work very well on um, OMR. So let's see how they fare. And I tried, we're just going to start with Photoscore. Very simple scores. Perfect conditions. Let's see if you can hear it. And so on and so forth. So no real challenge. This is something that actually can be solved quite easily. Okay, non-perfect image conditions, piano scores. You might know this song. So on and so forth. Also, not too bad. You clearly heard some mistakes, but you know, it's hard. Okay, handwritten. detected a lot of things here um, but as you can and they're claiming that they can also read handwritten scores so I think it's quite impressive to see that they're actually working um, to some extent but I'm not sure if correcting those errors would take more time than you know just typing it yourself right now but it's still you know quite a good step forward that this works let's look at another software smart score Same three music sheets. This is at least a good baseline, like perfect image conditions, it works to some extent. Simpsons. written scores were actually not working in my demo. I tried to find a threshold to, yeah, it needs to manually um, find a threshold for binarizing the sheet. I couldn't get it to run, so I'm going to skip this one. 
But you can see that the commercial applications for you know, perfect images actually do a quite decent job. And they've actually been used for um, some nice uh, applications. Um, for example, the Bavarian State Library has this Musicon score search, now in a beta version. And I'm going to give it a try now to see how it works. So what they did is they actually um, digitized a large set of music scores. Um, and you can search them. Let's see if you can... Oops. I think you got it. And they actually got a really nice interface as well. So you can see um, what the system detected. So it's not what the original image is, but what they detected here. And you can let it play back to you. <laughs> so, I think this is kind of a good, um, you know, part to like show you what the limits of OMR are quite are quite uh, are as of now. Um, so it's not perfect; it works to some extent. And if you're don't not relying on exact score transcription, but just want to do some retrieval, for example, like finding something by melody, this is actually something you can do already with OMR, and which works. Quite well, I would say. I mean, you could also add, um, enter here scores in um, in a different key, and I would still be able to find it. So that's a nice thing. Coming from the commercial applications to other tools that have been developed for optical music recognition, I'm going to show you a short demo of the Muski Marker application that has been developed by my colleague Jan. Um, and it's a tool that you can use for um, annotating handwritten music and you can also use it to do a lot of cool stuff that comes afterwards. So I'm gonna... Oops. It has been used to annotate the Muslima++ plus plus dataset, something that I will come to afterwards. So you load up the image and you can select parts that you want to um, analyze and take a look at. The user interface might not be the most intuitive as of now, but you know, as a research project, you probably know how it goes. <laughs> so we actually start here with the detection. We select an area that we want to detect and let it run. It's going to take a few seconds because it's running um, a convolutional neural network in the background to actually detect the symbols. And there you go. So you already see here as an overlay the detected symbols here. And I'm not sure what the first thing was you did. I think actually it was show. Okay, show the, show the symbols like highlighting them. And of course, you might have some, some errors there, some misdetections, so you could uh, select them, remove them, and this is already kind of an um, interactive workflow that you could use to fix errors or annotate data sets. So there is an error here that those two beams were detected as one, so you could go in there and remove individual pixels and therefore they would be split into two beams for later detection. Something that's very interesting here is that you not only can detect the things but you can also um, oh you could even do multiple things at the same time. So now we just split those nodes apart by erasing the pixels in between and now I detected the ledger lines correctly. And as you've noticed, this is handwritten, like this is handwritten music as well. And I think now we're coming to the interesting thing that if you want to take a look at these um, symbols, they're actually related to each other. So a notepad has a certain relationship 
to its stem, and this is built into the application. So this notation graph is can be visualized here, and you will see, or I'm afraid you probably cannot see, but there are small red lines between symbols, like the note head and its beam, that you know, um, represent the relationship between them. There was a false relationship here between these notes and that beam, so there were, you just remove them manually, and at the very end, you have a second pair of relationships, namely the temporal relationship, so what comes before what. This is for, like, monophonic scores can be quite simple, but um, as soon as you've got multiple voices that have different timings, it can be really complex. So, let's play this here. So you've got a second pair of relationships in green lines here that you can visualize. It's actually more for debugging. It's not meant for an end user to be used like this. But you can clearly see as a developer, okay, these things now flow kind of that way. So let's see if we can listen to this. That's about it. So that was the, the upper part of the stuff line being played back as MIDI. And one last demo of um, a problem that apparently is almost solved by now, which is the stuff line removal. So if you want to have a if you have a document and you want to see what's in the document, like the stuff lines, the notes, the lyrics, and so on and so forth. There is a, a really nice method that we'll explain afterwards and just to demonstrate how it looks like. So this is the original image and it's being processed patch by patch and you can actually see on the right hand side the output live as it is being computed and it extracts the symbols, the stuff line and the text and does that in a machine learning approach, a machine learning way, data driven way as well. And one more demo for you. Um, this is something you can actually try at home. So we've created a Google called a notebook and it is linked from the presentation. We will share it with you afterwards. But for now I'm gonna show it from my laptop here. Is an end-to-end System. So end-to-end -end meaning we take the image and we want the full detection as an output. Like image in, music out sort of way. And we'll hear more about this later by Jorge. But I'm going to just run the application right now here. And what it does is it has a few helper functions that I'm not going to explain to you now because they're kind of boring. But what it does basically is it takes an image opens up TensorFlow, loads a model, puts in the image, and directly gets as output the encoding of, this, of the nodes that are depicted in the image. So let's take a look at what has been done here. I mean, I just loaded five images here and let them run through. So let's take a look at those images. Start with the first one. That's the actual input image. Zoom it. Okay, and let's find the output here. So, can you read this? Can you read it? I, I can. I can make it bigger. Yeah, I'm afraid you can't see the image very well, but there. Two outputs that were directly derived from this image. So we we're going to start with a clef, with a G clef on line two, which are like enumerated from the bottom up. Then there's a, an accidental on a flat on line three, a meter sign on line three, a quarter note on stuff line one, 
a rest, oh, sorry, on space one, thank you. Uh, then a quarter on line three, quarter rest, and so on and so forth. And the second thing that this um, algorithm also outputs is not just the agnostic format, which says which symbol is where, but also assigns the meaning, the musical meaning. So the semantical um, detection of this would be a G clef, then the signature, which is F minor, major, major, yes, that's ma major. Um, a time signature as a common time signature, 4 fourth, um, and then actually a quarter F, 4, a quarter rest, an eighth rest, and so on and so forth, which already includes kind of the musical semantics directly as an output. And it was trained end to end with this data. So it was fed with these images that were distorted somehow. Um, unfortunately, they're depicted yellow here. They should just be black and white. It's an error. And um, even they were kind of massively distorted, some, some of them over here on the, top, on the, on the back there. Um, but still, the network actually learned to detect most of the things here, right? And if you want to learn more about this, there is a presentation tomorrow where we actually hear about these results. Hmm? Or even afterwards. No? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Good. With that being said, I'm handing over the microphone to Jorge to learn what is actually possible today and what not. I mean, you've seen some commercial applications, but let's see what the scientific field is. Yeah.